Hey everybody, today Rado runs through his top 10 civilization games, which I was surprised how many voters wanted to see this. This thing was really kind of like a blowout must has on the most recent voting ballot I did for what kind of top 10s. I mean, it's just completely, I don't remember what was in second place. It was so far behind. So people really want to see this. And actually, I'm not really quite sure why. Uh, and in fact, it was kind of a tough fist for me to make because for the most part, civilization games are not gens in my cup of tea. Because as a general rule, it's kind of hard to find a civilization game that doesn't feature a healthy dollop of warfare. It seems like civilization game designers just I have to tick that box where, yeah, oh well, great, uh, let's go ahead and build a civilization and now let's tear each other's civilizations down. And so that means the vast majority of civilization games out there are total non-starters for me and Jen because we don't want to destroy each other's civilization. We love the idea of building a civilization, seeing it expand and, um, you know, and, and, be, and become more... Uh, varied in what it can do as you know it advances in, in forms of technology but also as it advances across the world and by the end of the game we feel like we've uh, created something really big and monumental because normally a civiliza to be a civilization game you have to have an epic scope either in terms of time past like we're talking eras eon you know pass over the course of a civilization game that you start out from a little nothing into something major and or huge amounts of of space pass as you start out as just some oh we're just some little ho dung village but you know by the time we're done we have taken over a continent and this is our massive civilization and look how how impressive it is or both you know really for us that's what it takes to be a strong civilization game one the other or both and but for, it seems for most people you have to have that third component of oh and don't forget let's rip each other to shreds while we're at it so i'm about to talk about 10 civilization games that don't require that third element and i've just got them ranked <clears throat> from, you know, basically rank the same way I rank my overall games. Um, sometimes when I do these top tens, I, I, you know, I, I could have done this ranking for which is the most civilly, civvy-ish, which is the most civilization-y. But I just went for my, um, my least favorite to my most favorite. And so, let's jump right into it with my number 10, which is a game I don't actually own anymore. And to be fair, we liked it quite a bit, but I traded it away for a few different reasons. What is the game? Our number 10 is Antiquity, which I cannot show you the box, sorry. <clears throat> Why did we get rid of Antiquity? Because we certainly enjoyed the gameplay quite a bit. It was a very, very fun civilization game where you control a city-state that grows and grows and slowly and steadily over the course of this epically long game. I mean, there's another way you can um, really get a sense for epicness is the length of the game itself. It was a very, very long game, and our city-state grows, and we start creating additional city-states that um, you know take over the landscape. And the interesting thing about Antiquity is it focused... Well, it didn't really focus on warfare. I mean, players couldn't directly attack or destroy each other. There is some kind of player conflict you can do, but it's very, very minor. And the game didn't focus on that element. The game focused on the day-to-day -day maintenance of your civilization and the problems you face as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And it becomes more and more difficult to provide for all your people as your civilization grows. Now, that's a fairly common conceit. You see that a lot of growing pains is another really key component of a civilization game. But antiquity is really interesting in that it modeled waste, which is something that none of these other games really do in any significant way, that as a civilization becomes bigger and more prosperous, it kind of destroys the world around it. And that's definitely something you see happen in antiquity as, um, you know, the, 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 as, as the game goes on, the world gets smaller and tighter, not only because players are taking up more space, but because more of the world is really kind of ravaged by the advance of humanity as forests get leveled and, um, and, uh, uh, lakes get completely bone dry as they're, as they're completely fished into extinction. And a big part of success in antiquity is being able to manage your, is waste management. Very, very cool game. We really enjoyed it a lot. I haven't said why we got rid of it. Three reasons. The box is insanely stupidly big. And I've got kind of like a hard limit. I don't want to have more games than what I can keep on these shelves behind me. And having that box was very, very problematic. It didn't need to be anywhere near as big as it was, but be, that was the, probably the main reason I got rid of it was because it was so big. Reason number two, it's incredibly hard to get. Always rare and out of print. And 
basically somebody made me an offer I couldn't refuse um, because as much as we enjoyed the game, we didn't enjoy it as much as m how much money I made for flipping it in a, in a, in a sale. And, um, and then two, it was a very long game. Of all the nation building games I've got, it was by far the longest. And that made it very, very difficult for me and Jen to get it to the table as much as we'd like. So it just didn't make sense to keep it. But it doesn't change the fact that I think it's a brilliant design, even if it was a little fiddly. And I really admired a lot of stuff about it. Very, very unique. My number 10, Antiquity. And now, for the rest of the nine, I've got them all sitting right here next to me. So let's move right on to number nine. Progress, evolution of technology. And now, this is probably going to be the first one. Well, heck, I'm sure there's going to be people out there who say Antiquity isn't a civilization game. I'm sure almost every single one of these people are going to say, well, that's not a Civ game, that's not a Civ game. But to me, this definitely is. Although I, I, I recognize and acknowledge it's kind of, it doesn't necessarily tick the traditional box of a Civ game. Because what's interesting about progress te technology is, this focuses on one key element of building your civilization, and that is your progress of technology. At no point in the game is there any actual physical representation on a map of your civilization getting bigger and taking more land. Everything is very abstracted. What you develop over the course of hundreds of years, I mean this game definitely has the time scale part of a civilization down because you start as a little nobody in the age of antiquity and this lasts all the way up to modern day uh, as you play through multiple eras. And the only thing you're really focusing on is the technologies that your civilization masters that allows them to learn more and more technologies as you piggyback off of, oh, okay, we've learned this, now that we know this, we can learn this and this and this. And, I mean, the game has a very interesting tech tree element. And by the time you're done, you really do feel like you've built a civilization, but focusing only on the technology that your civilization is capable of using. It's a really, really nice game. Everything else, like I said, is abstracted out there, just like little dot. How big is your civilization? That's a meter. Um, you know, how many people are in your civilization? That's just a meter. But I don't care because we feel like having played a game of progress that we have built a civilization to that has spanned eras. And we really, really like the fact that, you know, there's no warfare in this at all. This focus is just on the best things of mankind. It is a very positive, uplifting game because it tells the story about just how smart we are. We are some smart, smart apes, and we use our brains to solve all kinds of problems, and that's what you get to do. And that's why we enjoy our number nine, Progress, Evolution of Technology. Then, moving on to number eight. Olympos. Now, this is the only game on my list that features direct player conflict. I mean, this is a game of competing civilizations that are spreading over, you know, this is, a, this is set entirely in antiquities, but <clears throat> we do start out just kind of moving some nomad tribes into the same land, and over the course of the game, we completely consume that land. I mean, we, we take it over, and there is a fair bit of trading of land back and forth as, oh, you've, you've conquered that little bit there? I'm going to conquer you, so it's mine now. But then you'll conquer me and take it back. And there's a lot of give and take. Now I've done a run through. Have I done a run through? I've done a run through for almost all these games, not all of them, but I have done a run through for Olympos. And I talked quite a bit in the final thoughts there why this was a game that features a healthy portion of player conflict. I'm stealing from you, you're stealing from me back. We're constantly butting heads. We're constantly going to war with each other. And yet it works great for me and Jen because the warfare element, when you take something from me, it's temporary. I can always take it back. It's, it's more of an inconvenience. You basically spend a certain amount of time because time is the number one resource in this game. The passage of time is what is what we're managing. It's our is what we focus on. And so I, if I want to take some land you've got, because it produces what I need to advance my civilization, either to learn new technologies or push further into the world or increase my overall population or whatever, um, I just have to spend time and I will take it from you. But you're still in there. It's like I haven't destroyed what you've built. I'm just borrowing. It's almost like I'm taking a book from a library that you used to have and now I've got it checked out. Whenever you want it back, you can just spend a little bit of time and get it back. So it's almost like kind of like we share the land. Um, you know, and thematically we're fighting and we're trying to keep each other down, but mechanically it doesn't feel that way. And so we really, really enjoy it. And so it's a rare, rare game that features warfare that we enjoy. And Olympos is one of them. That was number eight. Moving on to number seven, Roll 
through the ages. And I got to say, this one has a high, high nostalgia factor for me because Pandemic from designer Matt Leacock was the game that got us into modern designer board games years and years ago now, back in 2000, I think it was in 2010, maybe. And, um, you know, after we played Pandemic and we loved it and we loved this idea of cooperative games, we just spent all our time looking for more cooperative games and we found it hard at that point anyway to get other cooperative games that we could both enjoy. So we figured, oh, what the heck? You know, Pandemic was designed by Matt Leacock. He's designed this other game. It's not cooperative, but let's give it a try. Maybe we'll enjoy competition. And we loved it. This is a wonderful, wonderful reimagining of Yahtzee, of taking a bunch of dice, custom dice, very, very cool, big wooden dice that have all kinds of special symbols on them that represent the different ways your, techno your, uh, your civilization could advance itself. And you roll, lock some in, roll some more, lock some in, roll some more, and then that's what you get to do this round. And the game is all about taking those dice you've rolled and using it to build up your civilization, giving yourself, again, new technologies. That's going be a common refrain throughout here. It's a big, big part of a uh, civilization game is advancing in technology so that you can feel that your civilization is truly growing and developing. So you're spending your dice on technologies, you're spending your dice to increase your overall population, you're building monuments that will stand the test of time, you're, um, you're doing a lot of stuff. It's a really, really clever game. I think this is the only game I have not done a run through on, but we love it a lot. And to this day, we'll still get it out every once in a while and enjoy it, even though we played it so many times now, but it's always a fun, quick game with incredible production. Everything's wood. I mean, there's no cardboard pieces in this game at all. Your boards are big, gigantic blocks of wood. The, the dice are big blocks of wood. It's really, really neat. A blast and, um, and important for us because this was the game that proved to me and Jen that, hey, there are competitive games out there that we can enjoy even though we don't want to attack each other. And who knew? A civilization game would be one of them. Roll through the ages. Okay. Moving on to number 10, 9, 8, 7, number 6, Nations of the Dice Game. And actually, it's interesting. I mean, uh, you know, these kind of just come out relatively close to each other on my overall game rankings. But Nations of the Dice Game has kind of replaced Roll Through the Ages, the Dice Game, as our go-to, hey, let's build a civilization by rolling lots of dice. This is the same kind of thing. And um, in this game, you are... Uh, you're, this one doesn't borrow the Yahtzee structure. This isn't about roll, lock, roll, lock, roll, lock. This one is roll and then try to use the dice you've got or change the dice you've got to achieve various things. This game, um, I don't think you can consider a civilization game if it didn't have the epic sweep of history, which it does. Once again, you start out in the era of antiquities, and, I, and the game basically comes to an end kind of around uh, the turn of the century, the entry into the 20th century. So it's got that scope. It's got that epic feel. And by the time you're done, my civilization is going to be very... Very different, very unique from your civilization. Even though this is a quick 20-minute game, it has this incredible, epic s sense of sweeping majesty. Because Roll Through the Ages pretty much just stays in one age, the Bronze Age, if I recall correctly. Yeah, uh, yeah, it actually, it's called the Bronze Age. This one covers pretty much all of modern human history in the same amount of time in a very, very quick, fun, and exciting and satisfying dice game. We really enjoy it quite a bit, the number six, Nations of the Dice Game. And then moving on to number five, Race for the Galaxy. Now, this is civilization in space as we try to build up our own galactic empire. And we start out with just one little planet on some little uh, back corner of the galaxy. But by the end of the game, you know, what started out very, very small is huge. I mean, this game has the biggest scale um, expansion of any game in here because, yeah, you start out owning one planet, and by the end of the game, you'll own, you know, 10 planets, 12 planets. I mean, and all these planets give you different abilities as, as you either expand through military or through colonization and claim more and more planets and, at the same time, develop more and more technologies that makes you better and better at claiming more planets. By the end of the game, you feel like you have created an insanely epic, um, star empire, star civilization. I mean, and the, the time frame of this game, it must be hundreds of years that it took to do it, to travel all over the place and, and claim all these things and build up all, you know, this incredible accomplishment. And it's a blast, too. It's, it's just pretty much a game run entirely by cards. And every round, you've got a handful of cards, and you want to play all of them because they are all wonderful additions to your civilization, your spacefaring civilization. But to play, but you have to pick one card. 
Because most of the other cards, you'll have to discard to play that one card. And that one simple decision that you're making throughout the game over and over and over again is so interesting and so compelling. And on top of that, you're also trying to pay attention to what your opponents do. There's no direct conflict in this game, but there's definitely interaction. Because if I can anticipate what you're going to do on a given round, I can kind of ride on your coattails and get to do that same action for free. So um, you're really definitely invested in what your opponents are doing while everybody focuses on building their own intergalactic civilization in Race for the Galaxy. Now let's move on to, was it, number four, where um, we're, we're in the, the final stretch, folks. Here's another really weird one I'm sure a lot of people are saying, oh, come on. Really? That one? A civilization game? Yeah! Who says civilizations have to be all about human? A civilization game has to be about building a human civilization. What about an ant civilization in Miramis? Now, I said right up front that for me to, to consider it to be a civilization game, the game definitely has to have an epic scope. Right, either in terms of you know expanding across the board and feeling like you've built a big uh, civilization and you know claimed lots of land and built a huge infrastructure, or an epic scope in terms of the huge passage of time, you know, hundreds of years, if not thousands, in some of these cases, of time passing that makes you feel like you have truly created something. Now, Miramis doesn't do either of those necessarily, but you have to understand, the scale is very different. All these other games are really about human civilizations, even Race for the Galaxy. Um, this is about an ant civilization, and a single ant colony is a civilization. And in this game, that's what you do. You run one ant colony, and the world in this game is not, you know, all of Eurasia. The world in this game is somebody's backyard. As my civilization and your civilization, my colony and your colony, are both trying to expand and claim more territory, you know, create a bigger population so we can achieve more stuff. We develop new technologies. They're just ant-based technologies that make us better at keeping alive. And we have to face, probably of all the games, some of the most harsh and punishing conditions uh, around and that can really set our civilization back. And the key to doing well in this game is to build a strong ant civilization that can survive through the lean times in winter and continue to thrive through you know all the, the bountiful times in spring and summer and autumn. It's a really clever game. I've done a run through for it and um, I, I stand by it. This is a wonderful civilization. It's just not a human civilization. And I think that's one of the things that really tickles my fancy about Miramis. Alright, moving on to number three. This is kind of a a, uh, a, a tie-in to an earlier game. I've already talked about Nations the Dice game. Well, I could not make a top 10 Civilizations game list without talking about Nations. Nations the Dice game's big brother. This game is phenomenal. And I think of everything I've talked about, this is the most Civilization-esque game. Um, you know, this, this is when... I, I think there's some people out there say, well, yeah, your top 10 civilization, this was the only Civ game you even mentioned because this feels more like a traditional civilization game. And um, although not entirely, this game doesn't have a world map. Again, the replicating or simulating the expansion of our simulation in, in terms of actual landscape, actual seeing our world get bigger and bigger and bigger. This game doesn't do that. It, it, um, our, it um, abstracts all of that. But the game still is epic in scope and sweep. As we start out again in the Age of Antiquity as a little, little tiny, um, you know, podunk startup civilization and by the end of the game, which again comes to around, you know, the turn of the, you know, the entry into the 20th century. Century, um, I, I, you know, it, it, this has an epic story to tell, you know, from the origins of modern man right up to today. But unlike its little brother, Nation's Dice Game, which does in 20 minutes, this is a big game too. It's not as long as Antiquities. This is a two-hour game for me and Jen, which is kind of like, you know, pushing the edge of just how comfortable we are playing. I mean, if a game goes much longer than two hours, it's probably not something we'll play very often. So Nation's is, for us... Epic in scope. I know for some people, it's not an epic civilization game unless it takes you at least five to ten hours to play. But for us, this is epic. And the other interesting thing, too, is this game, unlike every other game, really brings warfare between our civilizations to the forefront a lot more. But I have to say, I love how it does it because this game at no point is about me building up my war machine so that I can reach out across the table and start smashing your sandcastle that is your civilization. The, the, w as players, we never directly try to destroy each other. But 
if I make a really, really strong push into military and, I'm, and um, I've got a strong military, although that means I'm having to spend through the nose to maintain that military and I have a very warlike civilization, I can in every epoch or era, I forget what it's called, the gameplay takes place over several big eras that track the evolution of modern society, I can trigger a massive war. Now, that means everybody else around the table has to deal with that war, um, you know, either by making sure their military is high enough so that they're not really hurt by it. Um, you know, nobody comes in and destroys their stuff. They might lose some resources, but um, none of their actual, none of the things they've worked to build go away. Um, or instead, you know, a player, a nation in this game, a civilization, or your big nation you're building, could be very successful by ignoring military altogether and instead building up a strong infrastructure. And I love that, that, you know, this game, to, you know, tries to posit that nation building doesn't have to be at the expense of other people. You can peacefully coexist with other nations and be hugely successful, even if some of those nations have to be happen to be dicks and are trying to tear you down. You don't have to participate in that. And I, I think it's absolutely brilliant. I've done a run through for it so you can see more, but it's a phenomenal game, Jen. I love it. It's in, um, I should say this one and the the this is my number three. My number this one, my number two, and my number one are all in my top ten games of all time. Yeah, that's nations. So let's move on to my number two civilization game, Peloponnese. And now this one is kind of going back to roll through the ages territory or Olympos territory of uh, building a civilization, but only in the early age of antiquities. It doesn't have that scope of, you know, thousands of years. This is really just more of a hundreds of years, but in spite of that, it does have a big and broad enough scope that it does feel like, you know, I mean, the, the focus is, is less on, you know, the history of modern, but, you know, more about charting uh, in great detail the intro of modern humanity, modern human society. And it's a great, great game because you're doing everything you need to do in a great civilization game. You're building up your infrastructure, you're creating, you're claiming land, you're creating a bigger nation for yourself. And in this game, you're dealing with really strong, pressing um, external forces that can tear you down. Not from other players, but from game events like plague and earthquakes and whatnot that can decimate. Well, not strictly because decimate has, but you know what I mean when I say decimate. They can really work your civilization over and set you back significantly. The core of this game is an auction. It's a very, very smart once around auction system that is incredibly tense and exciting, even with only two players. I've done a few different run throughs of this now. We love it a lot. So I don't need to spend much more other than to say it's my second favorite civilization game of all time. And in our top 10, we love Polyphonies. And I have to admit, I haven't played it yet, but I cannot wait to try Polyphonies the card game. But, this is it folks, our number one civilization building game of all time. It's number eight in my top ten games of all time. Um, so you, and, what is it? Seven Wonders. Once again, we're talking about civilization, but only within the confines of the Age of Antiquities. Um, because we, uh, but we play through three Ages of Antiquities. So, there is still a big sweeping scale to this game. Not as big as some of them, but big enough that it really does feel that at the end of the game you have created a mighty civilization in the old world that will be sung about and stories will be told about and history will be recorded for millennia to come and will, you know, and the and the, the civilization you build will reverberate even on to the modern day. And that's definitely the case. You know, the it's a card drafting game, so you're very, very directly involved with what players do, even though you never come right out and attack other players, even though you can and once again, like nations, build a very, very strong military. But in this game, me, me being the strongest military is not about me crushing you and destroying you. It's just a way to earn points. If um, I have stronger military than my neighbors, hey, I get extra points every round. That's a great and wonderful way that Jen and I very much enjoy to replicate or represent the impact of military because we don't want to destroy what each other has built. We just want to do the best we can ourselves. And it's a wonderful, wonderful card drafting game. And for my, for Jen's and my money, it even though it could play up to seven players, it plays best as a two-player game. If you'd like to know more, you can watch my run-through because I talked about it at great length why this is a fantastic, phenomenal two-player game. It used to be my number seven of all time, but it recently got pushed down, so it's my number eight. I really, it's unfortunate. I love Seven Wonders being the seventh, but it just isn't anymore, but it's still in my top ten of all time, and it's our number one civilization-building game. Oh, seven Wonders. And that's it, folks. 
seven or ten civilization building games you tell me if you think i'm crazy or not i'm sure plenty of people do and uh if you're wondering well hey where was x y or z um well chances are Whatever one you're thinking of should have been on my list, it probably wasn't either because it's too long or it's too focused on direct player versus player conflicts. And by that, I mean specifically me, again, reaching across the board and smashing what you have built. So there's a lot of wonderful civilization games out there that we very much enjoyed and thought were brilliantly designed, but just didn't work for us because we don't want to steal from each other or destroy each other's stuff. And so that's why these 10 made the list and so many others did not. But anyway, that's it, folks. Thanks for watching. Questions, comments, concerns, as always, let me know. And otherwise, I think I'm going to end it right there. Talk to you later. So long. Bye-bye.